Jeff, Sally, friends, <clears throat> it's indeed a great privilege and an honor to be here. And the story that uh, Jeff related about our first meeting is something that's fixed on my mind indelibly because it's only unusual uh, incidents and occurrences like that which uh, really bring people together. And I can tell you, he, of course, uh, naturally, in the interest of time, he omitted some of the details. But what kept me going that night when Larry kept phoning me from his um, satellite phone, uh, saying that the roads are blocked, the road through Bawali is uh, closed, you'll have to come through an alternate, alternate route, spend the night wherever you can and come in the morning, but I had a driver in my vehicle who was almost as mad as I am. And he said, no, we'll keep going. We'll see. We'll reach there at some stage. But what was most interesting was one particular area where there was literally a river flowing uh, down the mountain. And we saw a line of cars and trucks lined up on both sides, obviously fearsome about uh, crossing that river or stream which had come into existence. So I waited for a while, and then I saw a truck actually cross the place. So I told my driver, I said, let's back up, speed up, and I'm sure we'll make it. <laughs> and we did. We reached at 3 o'clock at night, and um, there was a straw mat just outside the place where I asked my driver to lie down, and I sat in the car, didn't sleep very much. But that was a wonderful experience. Uh, Jeff, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. This has been an extremely inspiring experience. And I'm so impressed with the power and promise of the school awards, the work that the school center is doing. Um, and you, you're really uncovering hidden heroes of society. And some of them perhaps would never have got known and see the enormous benefit you're creating by encouraging those who are not yet on the scene. But there will be many on the scene because this inspiration will travel. It's going to encourage, it's going to light a spark in the minds and hearts of so many others who can really make a difference. I have a feeling that social entrepreneurs might just prove to be the missing missionaries that we need for a fair and just society. I think there are two major implications from what social entrepreneurs are doing across the world. Firstly, I think they can fashion, they can develop a new development paradigm, which is based on culture, which is in tune with grassroots aspirations, sentiments, and values, which unfortunately we seem to have lost over the years, ever since industrialization began. I think the second important implication is that social entrepreneurs provide a form of governance which is extremely powerful, very compelling. It's not going to supplant existing institutions, but it can powerfully supplement them. And I think the work that social entrepreneurs do set a benchmark, set standards that would actually even move governments to do the right thing. So I believe that if one looks at the prospects of attaining sustainable development on this planet, I think those who will be in the vanguard will be social entrepreneurs. It's quite obvious that unmitigated forms of capitalism and extreme socialism have failed to address the challenge of sustainable development. As a matter of fact, both systems have proved to be antagonistic to this cardinal objective, which I think lies at the root of human progress and welfare. So the question is, how can social entrepreneurship provide an alternative path of development? I think this is a question which is, which is going to be answered, is being answered only by the actions of those who are present here and thousands, hundreds of thousands others 
who are working in the same spirit all over the world. I believe what is at stake over here is the ability to create human progress without unsustainably um, consuming the resources of nature and the wealth that we have on this planet. And when I talk about wealth, I'm certainly not talking about material wealth. I'm talking about the natural wealth that each one of us has inherited. I'm reminded, and I'm sorry if you've heard me say this before on other occasions, Mahatma Gandhi, who I quote extensively, because he was clearly a person ahead of his time, who was able to visualize the perils and the problems of an unsustainable path of development. On one occasion, he was asked by a British reporter, I believe, Mr. Gandhi, wouldn't you want India to reach the same levels of prosperity as Britain? And he thought for a moment. He said it required Britain to use half the resources of this planet. How many planets would India require? And I really think what we need to do is to look at how we have extended the footprint of human activities far beyond the ability of ecosystems to be able to absorb this major burden that we have placed on them. So the real challenge that I see is to be able to understand and to grasp the implications of a path of sustainable development. Gandhi, in his various ways, did easily define that path, but I'm afraid most of us have forgotten that. And we were given a reminder of this by another great leader, Mrs. Brundtland, who, in the commission that she chaired, came up with a definition of sustainable development, which in very simple terms says that it's that form of development which meets the needs of the current generation without compromising on the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, this seems like a very simple definition, but it's laden with value. It's laden with value because it clearly establishes the importance of intergenerational equity. And it clearly